Science Institute. I'm very happy to have these two programs running this semester on uh, causality and uh, learning in games. Welcome to the boot camp for the learning in games program. Uh, it looks like a, a very exciting uh, week that we've we've got planned. Uh, I should start by saying a big thank you to the organizers for the for the boot camp, uh, also the program organizers. So Vasilis Tsukanis, uh, Kostas Taskalakis, Dylan Foster, Mike Jordan, Christos Papadimitriou, and Eva Tarosh. So a big thank you to those folks. Uh, so, um, you know, these boot camps, I think, are really important for the programs, getting, getting everybody on the same page technically. Um, they also have a huge archival value in, in, you know, giving a snapshot of the state of the art uh, with all these amazing uh, tutorial lectures. So um, it'll be a great week. Um, uh, just a few uh, logistics sorts of things. Uh, you know, we all have to wear masks. Um, please don't bring food or, or, or drinks in from outside. Um, you've, you've got all of those for the breaks. You've seen before the, the lectures in the morning and during the morning and afternoon breaks. For lunch, you're on your own. If you'd like to drop, um, you know, backpacks and things off, there are lockers on the far side of the building on this level. They work with a pin code, so you're welcome to use those. Um, hopefully you've found the, the Wi-Fi Cal Visitor or Eduroam. Um, uh, our videographer, Omid Farr in the booth here is gonna be you know, helping out with, with connecting speakers, computers and microphones and so on. Everything's being live streamed and we're on, we're on Zoom here. Um, also, uh, a big thank you to Kelani Penland at the back here, who did all the local arrangements for the boot camp. Uh, thanks, Kelani. All right, I'll hand over to Vasilis to tell us about the themes of the workshop. Yeah, thank you all for joining, either in present or, or virtually. Um, uh, so yeah, so the boot camp is supposed to be uh, some fundamental topics that will be very useful for the three workshops, for example, that uh, we've organized as part of the semester. The one is on uh, adversarial approaches to machine learning and uh, Kostas's talk and maybe George's talk will, uh, will be giving some fundamental, um, uh, you know, an overview of fundamental topics that will help in that direction. The other is on learning and strategic uh, behavior and Nika, Eva and, uh, and myself will be giving uh, some tutorials on topics related to that. And then the final workshop will be on multi-agent reinforcement learning. And so on Friday, we'll have a day of reinforcement learning. In the morning, Dylan will talk about reinforcement learning, uh, mostly from the theoretical point of view. And in the afternoon, Chi Jing will be uh, speaking virtually on multi-agent reinforcement learning. So thank you all for all the speakers for uh, agreeing to give these tutorials, which is a significant amount of work. And uh, thanks, Kosti, for, for presenting today. And so I'll, I'll hand it to you. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vasily. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. I'm excited to be uh, in Berkeley for the for these two programs. There, there are intimate connections between the two uh, programs, so I'm excited to be part of both. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming to this tutorial. So um, I didn't choose the topic for the tutorial, Vasilis did. So thanks, Vasilis, uh, for this web, uh, you know, for putting the weight on my shoulders and this very broad topic. So I decided to change it into an even broader topic. <laughs> All right. Um, but yes, yeah, since, since this is the first tutorial, I thought I would talk about various uh, questions on equilibrium computation and its interaction with uh, machine learning. So, um, you know, let me start with those uh, pictures that uh, people in the mail uh, show uh, to brag about the recent accomplishments in, in machine learning from image recognition and speech recognition to protein folding and uh, Atari games and translation and, 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 and text generation. So uh, at, the, at the optimization uh, uh, heart uh, of these uh, breakthroughs, uh, uh, broadly speaking, what lies is a minimization problem. Um, of course, you know, minimization is, uh, optimization is important and 
Optimization has, has found this recent, uh, uh, a lot of recent applications, important applications in machine learning. Uh, so, um, uh, what is different uh, uh, in, in in those you know recent um, machine learning accomplishments is that uh, the optimization problems that arise uh, deal with high dimensional, very high dimensional variables. The functions involved are not convex; they're typically non-convex. And they're essentially only accessible through uh, lower order, uh, you know, information like asking the function value or the gradient function value. On the positive side, these functions are, you know, almost everywhere differentiable uh, and smooth, and they're Lipschitz. So, um, and uh, you know, for all these reasons, for the you know the the fact that they're non-convex and they're only accessible through lower order information, typically the way you approach these optimization problems uh, is uh, via a, a simple method like gradient descent. And, and the good news is that in practice, uh, you know, even though the, even though those problems are non-convex, so. We know theoretically, we have established theoretically, various works do that, uh, you know, gradient descent reliably gets to local minima of these uh, loss functions. And, and the empirical finding is that these local minima do a pretty good job for the applications that we're interested in. It's not a guarantee, but that's an empirical finding for all the applications that I mentioned in the previous slide. So uh, okay, so the starting point of uh, this uh, talk and uh, the you know this semester maybe and uh, you know its interaction with the other uh, program is that um, uh, we have been witnessing a, a dawn of multi-agent learning applications um, in uh, machine learning uh, and. Uh, uh, there's a difference uh, between these applications here that you see like. Uh, uh, you know, AlphaGo and Libratus, uh, the, the algorithm that beats humans in poker, StarCraft, uh, you know, soccer between robots, uh, adversarial learning and, and GANs. Okay, so there's a difference on the optimization uh, uh, from the optimization perspective. And that is that, uh, um, uh, minim you know, th those problems are not minimization problems anymore, but they're equilibrium uh, computation problems. So in the equilibrium computation problem, an agent is not learning by themselves in some environment that is uh, stationary, uh, but uh, uh, they are learning and making decisions in an environment that is changing. And, and the reason the environment might be changing uh, may be various. Uh, it could be changing because there are other agents that are uh, that have conflicting or aligned interests, and they're also learning and making decisions at the same time. There may be adversaries uh, or noise or, or distribution shifts that uh, uh, poison the data, corrupt the data, or change the data from when learning happens to when the algorithm is being used. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the problem may be game theoretic implicitly because you know like the the other agent representing constraints you want to enforce like this was happening in GANs and and other applications uh, uh, recent applications in ML so uh, the game might be explicit okay so game theory is a important and old field and has found many applications in various in various disciplines so uh, the game could be explicitly modeling a game, a market, a uh, road network, a uh, data network, a uh, ecological or biological system, an energy grid, interacting robots, sensors, and so on and so forth. You know, you know, a game maybe, if you want, uh, be a good model for the brain, and, and you know, like, then you know, like learning and so on and so forth. Uh, or the game could be implicit. So. Uh, 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 the other agents may be representing constraints that you want to enforce uh, uh, on the primary, uh, you know, on the objects you're trying to optimize. Um, uh, a game could be uh, uh, modeling uh, the fact that you are uh, optimizing in a distributed way. Um, a game could be capturing the fact that you want your, uh, the, the, the thing you're learning to be robust to changing conditions. 
uh, and that's related to adversarial uh, uh, learning. Uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, learning uh, arises, uh, uh, sorry, uh, games arise very naturally in causal inference applications, and that's an interesting point of contact to the other program. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, games have, you know, as I was saying earlier, have been used to model the brain, to, 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 to study the cultural evolution of language and so on and so forth. So, uh, so, so games could be explicit or implicit, and we're interested in all these applications. Uh, as you know, so let me you know close this you know general slide with a dictum that uh, minimizations to current ML what equilibrium learning is for to future ML. Yeah. Well, I think that you mentioned a nice point about like uh, game could be there because of causal. Yeah. Uh, game could be there because of causal inference. Could you elaborate on that and give some examples? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, for example, Vasilis has done uh, uh, work on that. So, oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, like uh, doing causal inference from observational data requires you to use uh, instrumental variables or, or other uh, tools, and oftentimes this ca this come in as uh, uh, you know, like the, the constraints you, you want to enforce uh, look like conditional expectation constraints. And uh, to enforce those types of constraints, it's very natural to turn them into uh, uh, a min-max optimization problem. So, so yeah, and uh, I hope at some point during the semester, you know, we're gonna listen to Vasilis or, you know, like one of the seminars uh, and, 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 you know, dive into that more, but that's an important application. I hope, uh, in fact, uh, the next, the next uh, workshop for this program, will be devoted to min-max optimization. I hope we will have some talks about that there, yeah? Yeah, that's a great question, a beautiful connection between the two programs. Uh, in any event, uh, you know, coming back to the thread of my uh, uh, tutorial today, uh, there are issues, okay? So I was saying earlier that uh, uh, in non-convex optimization, gradient descent works in the sense of finding uh, local optima that in practice uh, are uh, perform uh, reasonably for the applications we're interested in. So uh, uh, on the uh, multi-agent front, uh, these methods are not as good, okay? So uh, our practical experience is that uh, uh, if you endow each of these uh, agents with the ability to run uh, a simple method like gradient descent, what you find in practice is uh, cycling behavior or even chaotic uh, uh, behavior, uh, methods uh, typically have a very hard time converging, let alone to something uh, meaningful. And uh, uh, you know, part of the goal of this tutorial is to understand how deep uh, this problem uh, is, all right? Okay, so, and uh, sort of like, you know, uh, to, to, to motivate kind of like a, a little more, uh, be a bit more concrete about where this, uh, you know, non convex is and so on so sort of arise. Oh, is there a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, just about the cycling behavior that yeah. you mentioned. Uh, don't these uh, dynamical systems often cycle around the equilibrium or cycle in a way that the average that averages to the equilibrium? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very common, uh, I, will, I will talk about this a lot. So that is very common when the game is well behaved. Uh, in a sense that I will discuss, if the game is not well behaved, uh, you, you know, all bets are off. Uh, but we'll get to that in a, in a, in a, in a little bit. Uh, so to, to motivate uh, that, you know, cycling and, you know, oscillatory and chaotic behavior, uh, let me talk about uh, specific uh, applications, uh, you know, uh, which is not an explicit uh, game. It is an implicit game. It's a, it's a game that we construct because uh, by looking at equilibrium, this game allows us to access something interesting. So uh, what GANs do, is they try to generate objects that are interesting and high dimensional. So, um, uh, so, so like the photos that you see here, which are, which are not photos of real humans, but these are photos of uh, 
uh, humans that uh, were uh, hallucinated by a deep uh, neural network. So that deep neural network uh, takes as input uh, boring randomness, uh, Gaussian isotropic noise, uh, passes it through uh, nonlinearities and several layers of, of uh, uh, linear and nonlinear operations, and uh, outputs an object that uh, is interesting. Okay, so that is at least the goal. So the goal is to turn boring randomness and low dimensional randomness into high dimensional interesting randomness by passing the boring randomness through uh, 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 an interesting function. Now, uh, how do you access, how do you find, how do you identify, how do you set the parameters of a neural network to do this job? So the adversarial, uh, so the uh, GAN uh, approach is to set up a two player zero sum game between a player who is tuning the parameters of this neural network and another player uh, who is tuning the parameters of a different neural network that is called the discriminator. So the, the, the architecture is like you see in this uh, picture. So the, there's a player controlling the parameters of a generator network and a player controlling the parameters of a discriminator network. Both are deep neural networks. So the player uh, controlling uh, the parameters of the generator uh, wants to tune them so that uh, boring samples become interesting samples. Uh, uh, at least in the eyes of the discriminator. So the discriminator's job is to take as input uh, either uh, photos uh, uh, generated by the generator or photos generated uh, photos from the real world and distinguish them. So the discriminator is uh, rewarded for uh, discriminating between fake samples and real samples from the target distribution. The generator is rewarded for fooling the discriminator. And there are you know, various uh, utilities you can write for the generator and the discriminator. Here's one, uh, which is used in what are called Wasserstein GANs. So you give the discriminator and the generator opposite utilities. So you set up a zero sum game. So the loss function for the um, uh, generator uh, which is the same as the uh, utility of the uh, discriminator, is how well the discriminator distinguishes uh, between real samples and fake samples. So you compare the expected output of the discriminator when you plug in a real uh, photo, uh, and you compare that against the expected output of the discriminator if you plug in a sample generated by the generator, so namely, sample boring randomness, pass it through the generator and then pass that through the discriminator. So if the discriminator is doing a good job, these two expectations should be far. Uh, if the generator is doing a good job, this expectation should be close. Uh, this is objective function is, you know, you know if, if the discriminator was rich enough, this is trying to capture the Wasserstein distance between, I mean, if you optimize this, it's trying to capture the Wasserstein distance between the two distributions. Then you set up a zero sum game, uh, uh, you know, hoping that uh, uh, if you compute the equilibria of this uh, 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 zero sum game, you will arrive at a generator that is fooling the discriminator, thereby doing a, a good uh, generation. Uh, question? Yeah, it seems like you don't actually want to compute an equilibrium here because the equilibrium is pretty easy. You just say uh, thumbs down, thumbs up on all the images that are in the database and thumbs down otherwise. So I can I can give you a equilibrium to this game, but it's not interesting. Um, like, uh, sure, but I guess, okay, like, uh, you know, uh, the, okay. So uh, I guess it depends on what you plug in here for this expectation, right? And whether this expectation converges to the to the, to the, you know, if you, if that expectation, you know, like if you, if the empirical converges to the target, right? So like, ideally what you want is that this doesn't have ridiculously large complexity so that uh, uh, the empirical expectation is a good approximation to the true expectation. So that what you just described isn't actually a good, you know, equilibrium for the game. 
So yeah, if you you know if this guy can memorize all the photos in the database, uh, you are correct. But you want to set this up so that uh, this doesn't have enough complexity to do that. And for this reason, uh, this expectation, which is over the real distribution, is well approximated by the empirical distribution over the database. Does that make sense? So, so uh, notice that here I've written the expected over all real images of all humans that could possibly like, th this is a, a distribution, it's an idealized, uh, 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 you know, generating process that biology gives us, mating humans and creating humans. Uh, and uh, this is uh, not uh, biological, <laughs> this is <laughs> but, uh, what the generator generates, right? And uh, um, yeah, so this is my objective function. Now, uh, in practice, I'm going to approximate this by the empirical average and uh, this one as well. And I hope that the two uh, are close to each other. Otherwise, what you just said is a valid complaint. But I guess I was wondering if it's more the some stochastic gradient scent or some algorithm is it's important what algorithm you're using to find it because it's the it's the uh, trajectory towards it that's actually more interesting than the equilibrium itself. So so all, all the issues around generalization of deep neural networks are relevant here for, for this to actually work uh, because typically this is actually going to have a you know large complexity and it's going to be hard to, like like unless unless you use ideas like what you're alluding to you won't be able to argue that you generalize well and you know like the, the truth of the matter is i i have I, I, no, I do not know of any gun except trivial cases that comes together with the certificate that they really did a good job okay all of it is practical so uh so that's a great question uh to think about during the semester maybe but but yeah your your complaints are all valid and you would have to do something uh, along these lines to uh, you know, save yourself from these issues, but yeah. But I'm not here to de I'm not here to defend Gans. I find it an interesting idea. I've, I, I know of no Gan with a certificate that it learned the target distribution. Yes. So, so there's something technical I don't understand about the definition of utility. Yeah. If if the discriminator um, perfectly identifies uh, the synthetic images as real and the real images as synthetic um you would get a negative value there um but in fact the generator is doing a very poor job right uh, so the generator is penalized if the discrepancy is big uh, you, you're, you're not looking at discrepancy right because there's no absolute value there Oh, you mean? Oh, uh, I, I, I mean, if, if the oh, discriminator so. actually reverses okay, the. Okay, fine, but but okay, but if we get there, the discriminator is going to put a plus, minus sign and you know reverse that. So that's not a, mm -hmm. a big issue. At equilibrium, this is not going to happen. Okay. Because the discriminator is going to put a negative sign and reverse that uh, effect. So that's not a big deal. Um, okay. Uh, the point is, I'm not here again to defend Gantt, but the point is, this is an interesting game. The variables X and Y are high dimensional. The utility functions are very non-convex, very non-concave. And the question is, um, you, know, you know, what is game theory, you know, gonna say about these types of games, all right? Uh, so the first problem is, these games may not have equilibria. It's very easy to construct games with non-convex uh, concave utility functions that have no equilibria. So, you know, what, what do we even recommend to compute in this scenario? What is a meaningful solution concept? This is, you know, one of the, one of the things I want to discuss. Without a lot of clarity about what the target is, practitioners have tried to run gradient descent to solve these problems. So what did they do? Because these things are high dimensional and really only accessible through first order information, they have the two players of the game, the generator and the discriminator, run gradient descent in parallel. So the, the, the uh, generator is you know, trying to optimize their utility function. The generator is optimizing their utility function because the two utilities are negatives of each other. You get this so called gradient descent ascent dynamics. All right. 
Now, people in practice don't literally run this dynamic. They add bells and whistles to that dynamic. But, uh, you know, roughly speaking, they have the minimizing player and the maximizing player do first order methods in parallel. And here's some stuff that happens, okay? So in this example, the target distribution is handwritten digits from the MNIST data set. And what these panels show is what distribution the generator is generating. If you were to stop the dynamics after 10K steps, 20K steps, 50K steps, and so on and so forth. So what you see here is that uh, along the training process, the generator is generating garbage symbols and settles on a uniform, you know, like, a, you know, a distribution over a single garbage uh, uh, symbol, okay? In the bottom example, the target distribution is a mixture of Gaussians arranged, whose means are arranged on a cycle. Uh, and uh, what you see here is another pr prototypical behavior of, you know, uh, GAN training dynamics, which is to uh, shift from mode to mode of the distribution. So, so the generator and the discriminator are chasing each other. So the generator is, you know, going around the cycle, generating from different modes of the mixture. So these are just examples of what uh, goes wrong in training guns. But 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 uh, issues uh, arise even for like for, for for trivial distributions. And here's one example. Uh, so imagine that the target distribution is a really trivial one. So a Gaussian, like uh, in two dimensions. Uh, you know, I put them in at uh, three and four. That's not important for the example. Isotropic Gaussian in two dimensions. And um, uh, let's try some very simple generator, a linear generator. It takes its input and adds the input to the parameters, two dimensional parameters. So you take the input, the z, you know, the, the, the z from, you know, uh, normal zero one, zero identity, you add to that x. The discriminator just projects. So that's my GAN architecture. So if I were to write down the Wasserstein objective, which is to compare, to, to look at how good a discrimination job the discriminator does. So I have to compare the expectation under the true data of the output of the discriminator versus the, the output of the discriminator on the fake data. What is the fake data? You take Gaussian samples, pass them through the generator, plug them into the discriminator. You know, what comes out of this is this very nice uh, objective function, which is a bilinear objective function in the parameters of the discriminator and the generator. Uh, it's a nice function because it's kind of, you know, linear in both the variables. And uh, this game has a very obvious equilibrium, which is for the generator to choose as X this vector and the generator to choose as Y the zero vector. If they do not do that, if they do not do as I described, the other player can punish them infinitely much, okay? So like if X does not choose this as, as uh, 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 their vector, the uh, Y player can punish them uh, infinitely much. And similarly, if this guy doesn't choose the zero as its vector, the other player can punish them infinitely much. So it's a trivial game, but here's what gradient descent does. Again, I'm coming to your comment in a question in a, in a, in a little bit. So what do you see? So here you see the two parameters, uh, uh, you know, y1 and y2, maintained by the discriminator. They are oscillating, and their average is zero, which is the target, which is the true, you know, the right thing. But they're oscillating around. Here are the two parameters of the discriminator. So, so they're also oscillating and their averages are good. So three and four respectively, but you, you get these oscillations which are very typical uh, in the case where the game is well behaved. So you, you oscillate around the equilibrium. So, so in a paper with uh, Vasilis and uh, Andrew Ilias and, and uh, uh, Zhang, what we did is we uh, uh, tried you know, various types of things that people do in practice to, you know, improve the training dynamics in GANs, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, using momentum, uh, uh, having the, 
you know, one of the two players uh, run in smaller speed. So, uh, you know, one step of one versus several steps of the other. And, you know, across the board, you see oscillations. This is hard, very hard to, to remove. Uh, in fact, oscillations arise, uh, you know, maybe this is the most trivial example of, of oscillations. It's a very similar game to the previous one. It's just uh, single dimensional. Uh, the equilibrium is zero, zero, uh, and, and here's what gradient descent ascent dynamics do. They're just pictorially, you know, as was mentioned earlier, uh, they are, you know, cycling and actually spiraling around and away from the equilibrium. So you can easily verify that, you know, this, this picture, because the gradient descent ascent dynamics look as this. If you square both sides and add them up, you'll see that the norm of the of the iterate increases as time progresses. All right, so, so to just wrap up, so training, this training oscillations and garbage solutions arise even in two agent uh, zero sum games, even when uh, both players know exactly the utility, so they don't need to learn them while optimize them, just they know them exactly, even if it's low dimensional. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, motivating the question of, you know, what, what's gonna happen if, you add all the complexities that you, you know, have in, uh, in, in, in general machine learning applications. So this is sort of like the topic of this discussion. Let's dive into more technical stuff. So the broad focus of this tutorial is gonna be on multiplayer games. So you'll have a lot of agents, uh, each with a constraint set, and each coming with their own function that they want to minimize. So it's a multi-objective uh, optimization problem or equivalently each with their own objective they want to maximize. So I'm going to be having, I'm, I, I might be talking about losses or utilities. So these are negative of each other, right? So game theory is like talking about utilities. Machine learners like talking about losses. So I'm going to maintain both notations for maximal confusion. Um, so um, in this type of uh, setting, you have tension, right? And the tension you may have is that it's possible that the you know, choices that other people make influence what actions are available to you. So uh, there's also tension because uh, each person's utility function or loss function depends on not just their own choices, but also the choices made by the other people. Uh, and, and, and you know, these utility functions may be misaligned. Uh, and, and, and players may be uncoordinated in, in, in trying to optimize those uh, loss functions. Uh, so, so game theory offers uh, solution concepts, uh, proposals for what might happen or is reasonable to happen in this kind of scenario. Uh, and the question uh, for this tutorial is, uh, what happens, uh, 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 well, if you have these agents run very simple algorithms. The main question of this tutorial is when agent use, uh, online, agents use online gradient descent or some other uh, uh, simple uh, learning uh, dynamics, will the uh, joint uh, uh, behavior of the system converge to, in some sense, to Nash equilibrium, correlated equilibrium, or some other reasonable solution concept. Now, from an optimization standpoint and game theoretic standpoint, I mean, all standpoints, I guess, uh, it's really important to uh, whether the utility functions are concave in uh, uh, you know, their own actions. Uh, uh, equivalently, uh, whether the loss functions are convex in a player's own, act, own actions. If this is the case, this is called a concave game. If this is not a case, this is gonna be called a non-concave game. So the um, terminology concave comes from the fact that typically in game theory, you, refer, you, you talk about utilities, right? You want utilities, you maximize your utility, you want to be facing a concave function you're optimizing. Right, so typically in game theory, models uh, postulate concave utilities or quasi-concave utilities. 
But uh, as I was mentioning earlier, with the example of GANs, uh, you, you, may, you may encounter very commonly non-concave utilities. So, uh, uh, and you know, that's part of the, uh, of the discussion here. So now, so in non-concave utilities, uh, even equilibrium existence is at risk. So in general, there are no uh, equilibria uh, that you find in, 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 in you know, like, in a typical, like, like there's a non-Nash equilibria, correlated equilibrium, and so on and so forth. But even in concave games, you have computational issues with some of these equilibria. So uh, you might be interested in uh, equilibria that are tractable. All right, so the important you know, distinction is concave versus non-concave games. In concave games, there are issues of tractability with some solution concepts, and we want to understand the behavior of uh, uh, tractable solution concepts, such as correlated equilibrium and minimizing regret. On the non-concave front, it's not even clear what we should be targeting. And, and, and in this tutorial, I want to talk about all these uh, questions. So let me be a bit uh, uh, more precise. So another focus uh, 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 is going to be zero-sum games. Uh, and the zero-sum games I'm going to be talking about are games where you know you have two agents. One is paying the other. So L is a loss for this guy and a gain for that guy. So this guy gonna, wants to minimize the loss. This guy wants to maximize the loss. And there are some constraints that tie the actions of the two players. Uh, uh, in general, the only assumption I'm going to be making on L is that it's Lipsitz and smooth, so it's, it's, it's gradient is Lipsitz, and that the constraint that couples the actions of the agents is convex and compact. But I'm not going to necessarily make a simple, simpler assumptions unless I state them. I will focus on simultaneous games in this tutorial. Uh, however, sequential games are also very important to study, and I will touch upon them a little bit uh, if I have time. There is, in particular, a lot of work, including people uh, in, from people in the audience, on the sequential version of the problem, where one of the two agents is committing on a decision first uh, and letting the other player respond. Uh, when talking about zero-sum games, I uh, regardless of whether it's simultaneous or sequential, I will abuse notation and uh, for compactness represent it as min max. It will be clear from context whether this min max is a simultaneous min max or a sequential min max. And similarly, I may be talking about min maximization or max minimization, uh, uh, referring to both problems, the simultaneous and the sequential. Uh, again, uh, the context uh, will uh, elucidate what I'm talking about. Now, when thinking about zero-sum games, the, uh, uh, it's illustrative to compare the situation to the uh, single, single agent optimization problem. We're just minimizing a loss, one agent in the world, minimizing a loss by themselves. And uh, uh, to, to make this comparison, it's... Uh, Interesting to consider two settings, the, 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 let's say the classical setting and the deep learning setting. Yeah, is there a question? There is a question from the virtual end. Oh, what does yeah. it mean for Nash equilibrium to be intractable? What does it mean for Nash equilibrium to be intractable? That uh, it means that uh, uh, in, in that context, it meant PPD complete. So it is, um, com you know, it, is, it is complete for a particular complexity class. Uh, that class is not the NP class, which is more common. Uh, common in uh, uh, you know when writing intractability uh, 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 theorems, uh, it is a class of problems that contains other perceived hard problems, such as finding bra fixed points and and so you know Sperner uh, lemma and other and other problems in topology. So uh, in that context. Uh, Nash equilibrium being intractable meant that it is as hard as any other problem in the, that class. So in particular, as hard as finding fixed points of, or approximate fixed points of Lipschitz functions. Uh, and uh, I, I will touch upon this uh, uh, in my third, in, my, in, in part three of my, uh, in my tutorial, a little bit more. So in any event, so making this comparison, which is illustrative, 
uh, it's important to distinguish the classical setting and the, uh, and the you know, modern deep learning setting. So in the classical setting, what you want when facing a minimization problem is that your uh, loss function is convex. In the, in the min-max setting, what you want is that your loss function is convex with respect to the minimizer player's variable and concave with respect to the maximizing player's variable. Uh, uh, if you have this, you have also von Neumann's min-max theorem, which states that if your uh, constraint set is a product uh, constraint set, then you can swap the order of min and max. So in particular, simultaneous and sequential doesn't matter in that setting. Uh, from an optimization standpoint, uh, also the, the problems are uh, essentially uh, equivalent. Uh, so we know of many methods uh, to solve them. In fact, I hope that in, the, you know, in, in my next lecture, I'm gonna show you uh, one of these theorems. Uh, uh, but long story short, there are many first order methods that find approximate minima for, for minimization problems and approximate min-max equilibria for, for, for these types of problems in a, a number of steps and queries to the loss function and its gradient uh, uh, that are polynomial in the desired approximation, the uh, smoothness, so the ellipsis of the gradient, and the, some notion of diameter of the constraint set. And by approximate local minima, what I mean is points x star that cannot be uh, uh, changed to decrease the function by more than epsilon. Similarly, uh, over here, I mean, uh, uh, as epsilon approximate equilibria, I mean, points x star y star, such that changing x cannot decrease the function by more than epsilon, changing y cannot increase the function by more than epsilon. So if you're, you know, if you're interested in these types of uh, approximate uh, global uh, solutions, uh, you, you can attain them uh, in a number of steps that is polynomial in the underlying parameters. So the two problems are not very different in their classical uh, uh, setting. Uh, 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 coming back to this picture, now uh, where we got a gradient descent, a first order method oscillating around the equilibrium, uh, the conclusion is that the training oscillations we see here are not an artifact. They're not reflecting any underlying intractability in this problem, but they are an artifact of the method that we're running here, gradient descent ascent. So one of the questions I wanna ask in the, uh, uh, later today uh, in the next lecture is, is it possible to change the method to modify it so that you don't see these uh, oscillations, this, this uh, looping uh, behavior? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, yeah, so uh, yeah, exactly. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this, you know, starting here, the equilibrium is here. And I'm oscillating around and away from the equilibrium. That's an important point. Yeah. That's because we started the discussion about the inner and outer uh, oscillation. Someone could say why I cannot backward run the, the problem in order to have the oscillation inside. Correct. Th that would give the. A... Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that. And that's motivation for some of the methods that I'm going to discuss. But yeah, so at this, you know, at this. You know, level of generality, one of the questions I'm going to ask is uh, this can we change the method somehow to remove those oscillations? The other question I'm going to ask, uh, give us a moment. Is, oh, actually, please ask your question because so, I'm going to change. I'm going to, I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, what is the key difference between the classical and the modern setting? I'll get to that in a okay. Okay, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, roughly speaking, is you have non convexity. That's, uh, okay. yeah. So here we have a nice function we're trying to minimize right the convex function and here we have a function that is convex in the minimizer variables uh, in the minimizing var minimizer players variables and concave in the maximizer right so for any choice of x the maximizing flip player is, is facing a nice concave function for every choice of y the minimizing player is facing a nice convex function so you're trying to find a subtle like a global subtle point uh, and, and you know, as, 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 as you know, these two boxes illustrate, you know, they're not 
you know, like, you know, this is not more challenging than that one. And in many senses, they are equivalent. Yeah. For this example, is the key difficulty because the function is not strongly concave and strongly convex in their respect? That is correct. So if, the, if this were strongly convex and strongly concave, you wouldn't have this issue. Uh, okay, good. That's a great point. So second question I want to ask is a different one. Uh, and that's more uh, 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 motivated from a, from a pure optimization uh, standpoint. So uh, what is the fastest possible rate at which uh, you know, these types of you know, learning dynamics can uh, converge uh, to, uh, can identify the equilibrium, whether they're oscillatory or not? That's the second question I wanna ask next, in, in the next part of my uh, uh, tutorial. Okay, so for concave games, which uh, we're gonna look at in the next part of the tutorial, uh, uh, we're interested in two questions. Can we remove the oscillations? Second question is, what is the best rate at which we can compute uh, equilibria in these games? So these are the two questions that we're gonna be talking about in the next part. Deep learning setting is when you drop convexity here and convex concavity here. So you just assume lipsitness and smoothness of your utility. And, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, I'm gonna focus on the simultaneous case. And uh, def it definitely is different now from the uh, uh, sequential case. One little comment only, under product constraints, this is easier than that, or better said, this is not harder, sorry, this is not harder than this, okay? Yeah. Looking at the strategic setting, uh, what you have on the right uh, yeah. looks to me like a sequential game where- uh, Correct. The way I have it, you know, that, that goes back to the comment I made earlier that I'm going to be abusing the notation uh -huh. and writing this in a compact form, oh. whether I mean simultaneous or sequential. So this is a better picture. So you have two agents, one is paying the other, they have to choose simultaneously. Abusing notation, I'm going to write it like this. Whether, you know, whether this mean and max are in parallel or sequential uh, depends on the context, I will mostly be focusing on simultaneous. Okay. Yeah. Can you elaborate more about what do you mean with the phrase under product constraints simultaneous is not easier? Yeah, so what I mean is that uh, uh, if we can solve this, then, but it's a little bit out of context, but if you can solve this, that is a solution to that, if the constraints are correct. Okay. Uh, but not the other way around. So the solution sets are nested. Um, all right, so with non-convexity, as we know, minimization problems are NP-hard. So these are NP-hard a fortiori. In fact, uh, in the simultaneous case, there may not even be equilibrium. So, so even equilibrium existence is, is problematic if this game is simultaneous. Okay? If it's sequential, it's not a problem, but if it's simultaneous, it is a problem. But, uh, uh, you know, the approach uh, in the ML is to just uh, target non-local equilibria in, the, in this uh, case. So, you know, let's, let's study local equilibria. So what could be uh, local equilibria? Well, here's a definition. Uh, I'm gonna be calling X star an epsilon delta equilibrium if uh, changing X star in a ball, a delta ball around it, intersect the constraints, cannot decrease the function by more than epsilon. Same uh, over here. So an epsilon delta local mean max is a point x star by star so that I cannot change x in a ball, uh, intersect the constraints to decrease the function more than epsilon and sim you know, symmetrically for the y player. And uh, you know another way to an equivalent way to view these uh, two solution concepts that I have on the board here is that they're uh, equivalent to I mean if delta if the radius in which you're looking for deviations is small enough compared to epsilon and the smoothness these are actually equivalent to fixed points of the gradient descent map on this side and the gradient descent ascent map uh, uh, for this side. 
Okay, so you can view them in uh, two ways, uh, either with these two uh, definitions, or if you if that's better for you, think of these as uh, fixed points of the gradient descent map, and these as fixed points of the gradient descent ascent map. Okay, these are equivalent as long as you're not too greedy about your delta. Like your delta is small enough compared to the target epsilon and the smoothness. All right, so what do we know about these problems? Well, on the left-hand side, I mentioned that earlier, and uh, here's the formal uh, theorem. Uh, if you're not too greedy about the delta, about the radius in which you're trying to find the, you, you have, you know, you think about deviating, uh, then first order methods, uh, find the uh, epsilon delta local minima in a number of steps and queries to the functions that are polynomial in the approximation and the smoothness. So no problem there. If you are too greedy, you change the problem from a local one to a global one and it's empty hard. All right, so of course you cannot be too greedy because you turn your problem into a global optimization problem. But if you're not too greedy, first order methods work. On the right hand side, because of this equivalence to fixed points of the gradient descent ascent map, you can also argue that these things exist if you're not too greedy. If you are too greedy, they don't exist. But if you're not too greedy, they do exist. And for this reason, it's a reasonable target for optimization methods. Yeah, because they do exist at least. Okay, if you're too greedy, they don't even exist. So you know, good luck, uh, you know, checking for them. But. Um, all right, so the question here is, uh, okay, so they do exist, but what's the complexity of them? So the questions I'm gonna ask in the third part of my tutorial is uh, questions around, uh, you know, along these lines. So, uh, so, so, so for in the, in, in the deep learning setting, uh, training oscillations could be reflecting computational intractability. So what I wanna investigate is, do, you know, is there underlying intractability even when you switch to local notions? Right, so over here, the, you know, once you switch to local notions of local solution concepts, there is no interruptibility. So the question I want to ask here is: Is it the same thing? Is it, you know, do you remove interruptibility on this side as well, or is there still interruptibility even though you're looking for local solution concepts? If there's still interruptibility here, even if you look at local concepts then you know um, that could explain the issues people face when training guns. That's, that could be an explanation of why they have a hard time uh, optimizing guns versus you know, solving this other you know, like language models and so on and so forth. So that's the question I'm gonna ask in the third part of my tutorial. And lastly, in the, in the, in the fourth part of my tutorial, <laughs> I'm gonna ask the following question. If there is intractability, what are tractable game classes? What are tractable solution concepts? What would be a, a computationally uh, tractable uh, framework to develop for these, you know, non-concave games? Okay, so what is the, you know, so, so game theory has spent most of the past hundred years since the paper of Borel um, uh, thinking about concave games uh, uh, with a lot of success in, in various disciplines. So I guess the question is, uh, you know, what what should they do in the next hundred years? Hopefully, this semester and this program at Simon's will carve out some path for what game theory should do in the next hundred years when facing non-convex, non-concave utility functions or non-convex loss functions. So to summarize the goals of this tutorial. I'm going to be thinking about uh, games such as uh, you know uh, so, you know mostly simultaneous games involving multiple agents with you know different uh, utility functions, and uh, the question will be if they run some simple method, will they get to some meaningful solution concepts? And I'm going to, as I was saying earlier, I'm going to distinguish concave games and non-concave games, uh, and. Uh, 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 ask uh, the questions that you see summarized on the board. On the non-concave side, which is the topic of the next uh, hour today, I'm going to ask, is there a way? So, so again, these are tractable games, but uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to ask the question first, can we remove the oscillations that we experience uh, in these games? 
uh, that learning, uh, for, you know, like uh, that uh, learning dynamics experience in these types of games, and um, well, you know, what the optimal rates of convergence are to equilibrium in these games. So these are the two questions. This is about removing oscillations. This is about just plainly what's the fastest way to get to equilibrium. Uh, on the, the non-concave uh, game side, uh, tomorrow, first hour, I'm gonna be looking at the complexity of finding local solution concepts in non-concave games. Uh, long story short, it's gonna be intractable, okay? <laughs> uh okay so you know <laughs> and um but you know i'm going to show you how to prove interactability uh and uh you know uh since even local solution concepts are interactable the question is what becomes of deep learning in that setting right so if you know if gradient descent is not going to be working for us anymore in the multi-agent uh, uh, learning setting, you know, what should we do, all right? And I'm gonna be talking about classes of games where there is hope, as well as solution concepts that are tractable and, you know, bypass maybe sidestep some of these intractabilities. So uh, these are, uh, uh, yeah, so this is, this, this is a summary of what I'm talking about and maybe there are three minutes uh, for questions. Um, the first question about the, okay, I will have, we will have the chance to discuss them more in detail for each question, but for example, even if they are intractable, uh, simplex in one sense, in theory, it seems to be a, a very bad uh, method, Right. Uh, but in practice, we love it. Sure. Uh, <laughs> could, could be the same case that, for example, the smooth complexity, the smooth given that we have not defined that kind of stuff, like what is the smooth PPAD right. uh, behavior? Do, do we have any idea about this kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, so first of all, from a complexity standpoint, smooth PIPA, I mean, there, there are recent papers for smooth games. And in fact, uh, uh, there was a paper last year that, you know, if you take a normal form game and you uh, perturb it with noise, that's still PPAD complete. So that's not gonna be uh, an avenue for you. So. But an avenue for you would be to characterize game classes where uh, you can hope that the equilibria uh, are tractable, which is you know, uh, the motivation for this uh, question. Definitely, uh, you know, uh, tractability results are often worst case. And the one I'm gonna be talking about is worst case. So which uh, you know, um, motivates several avenues for research. But um, the importance of intractability results is that they remove the confidence that you have that, you know, you can just run gradient descent and get somewhere and you know let's see if that is good practically right now there's no confidence so either you um build you cannot build a computational framework without any confidence that running your basic tool which is gradient descent will get you somewhere all right before you inspect if that is actually interesting yeah i know a couple of the colleagues watching this online are optimization theorists who've worked on equilibria for their whole career. Right. And so they're going to want to ask, before the computer scientists got interested in all this, we had, say, extra gradient method. Right. And it provably did some of these things. So sure. I know you'll probably talk about extra gradient, but I maybe will, quickly, will... could you sort of say, yeah. <laughs> what did extra gradient not do that you know, you're aiming to do? That's right, yeah. So I will talk about extra gradient and related methods for when I talk about concave games. So extra gradient does not resolve the issues over here, but it uh, does uh, uh, remove oscillations. And in fact, I'm going to show a classical proof from the 80s, but not for extra gradient, but a related method that uh, shows you how to at least asymptotically uh, uh, have last iterate convergence to equilibrium. So I, will, I, will, I, hope, you know, I, I hope that I will be able to present the proof. Uh, uh, and, uh, and yeah, and, and then I'm going to ask some questions around that. Okay, but uh, you know, Long story short, rates are not understood uh, for last iterate convergence. Rates are well understood for the average rate of convergence of these methods, but uh, last iterate rates are not understood. Yeah. So uh, just to understand 
something about the third question. Uh, when the game is computationally intractable, uh, you say that you see training oscillations. Uh, does that mean that they cycle around the point that is not in equilibrium or, or that they don't converge to anything <laughs> even ergodically? <laughs> That's right. Uh, so oscillations is a bad term here, okay? So oscillations is a word being used by people, you know, training guns, but, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I I'm referring to cha potentially chaotic behavior. Is I'm not talking about, you know, going around the equilibrium in a cycle. So uh, this the system could be chaotic and uh, it is not well understood what it does. So what I'm saying is, let's let's say that, you know, Replace training oscillation with with frustration here could be due to computational intractability. <laughs> uh, let me ask one last question for this session from uh, online. Is there any evidence, like in the single agent case, that in the multi agent case the local optima are almost as good as global ones? Uh, not as far as I know. I mean, these are all yeah. So these are all wide open questions. I mean, the we haven't you know done you know so. It's not clear what the, you know, like, I guess, you know, what the, the answer to this question will reveal is that, you know, um, the obvious ways to define local equilibria give rise to intractability. So definitely these are not good solution concepts anyways, because of intractability issues. Uh, so, you know, it's unclear if you want to study them because, you know, they're, they're intractable anyways, but so uh, there's no confidence that, you know, you, you will build a framework that, you know, will get there so that, you know, let's ask that question then. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, yeah, at this point, we don't even know what, you know, a, a plausible uh, tractable target is, let alone whether it's a good one. Uh, uh, but from a mathematical, let's say, standpoint, uh, uh, for GANs, say, because it depends on the application, uh, for GANs, I wouldn't think it's a you know uh, necessarily a good solution concept. But like uh, when you think about uh, agents, uh, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow a little bit. When you think about agents who only understand their utility functions uh, via first-order information about those utility functions, then these local uh, notions of equilibrium are very reasonable, right? Because these are points where all agents decide that based on the information they have, which is first order, they cannot improve, okay? Uh, so th that could be reasonable in that uh, type of context where, you know, you, you know, a lot of agents in a high dimensional setting only have access to their utilities through very simple queries. Uh, I, you know, I, I can buy that concept in that kind of uh, scenario. So let's... Um... End the session so that we have the break. Cool. There's going to be a 30 minute break because this is going to continue. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey, how are you doing? Good.